The title of my presentation today is uh, Crafting a 60 Second Pitch That Gets Noticed and Gets Results. All of you obviously attend, or many of you attend this group, and I'm sure others of you attend other groups that are like this group, where you have a very brief amount of time to get your help people understand who you are and what it is that you do and who you serve. That's another very important point. So we're going to talk today about how to optimize that 60 seconds that you have. Interestingly, what you might find is that in 60 seconds, it's actually more time than you think. What you all did right now which of just introducing yourselves probably was 15 seconds, 15 to 20 seconds, I would say. So one of the things we're gonna look at is what fits in a 60 second pitch. Obviously, if you have less time, you can shorten it a bit, and we'll talk a bit about what you might take out. If you have more time, you can embellish, you can make it longer. So those are some of the things that we're going to, to talk about today. I wanted, and I'm not going to do this very interactively because of the time limit, but if you do want to say something or have a question, either put it in the chat or somehow interrupt me or let me know that um, you'd like to make a comment. We're going to start out with this question, what is a pitch? And usually I do ask people to interact at this point, but today I'm simply going to tell you that a pitch is a communication event. I look at pitching from a very technical point of view, like how do we effectively communicate in this time limited format? So the, a, any pitch is short. A one minute pitch is particularly short, but even a five minute pitch is pretty short, which means it has to be very focused. And we're we'll talk about some of the elements of that focus. What we'll see is that words, the words that we use become very important. We have to pay very close attention to vocabulary when we're pitching. A pitch needs to be both informative and persuasive. And we're gonna look at that on a scale in a, in a couple minutes. But it, it should be more persuasive than informative. It allows you to connect with and motivate your audience. And in the end, what you want people to do are to take an action. And that's where the motivation part comes in. We have to trigger people to want to act. In the context of these types of networking groups that we're in today, some of the things that you might want people to do are refer people to you or recommend you to a person who might need your services. You might want to know about resources. There might be other things that you need just than those two things. But in some way, you want people to act at the, as a result of your pitch, let's say. The other thing about pitching these days is that we know that we're all distracted. Some of you will be distracted during this presentation. I know that, and that's fine. I, I'm not going to be angry about that. Uh, I, I have been trained as a an virtual instructor for online teaching and training and that kind of thing. And in that world, they say, just assume everybody's multitasking. If you can't see them, that's what they're doing. They're doing something else. So how do we, one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is how do we get our messages across in a world where nobody has time to listen to us and we, people have very short attention spans? So there are some things we can do to increase the likelihood that people will listen and engage. The next slide is about this informing versus per persuading continuum. And this is something that I use in all of my presentation skills training but we wanna think about what's different when we inform versus try to persuade. And if we think about it, the informing part is usually about what we do. It's factual, I'm a chiropractor, I see this kind of patient. All of these things are, are informative and they are objective and we might not be super excited about those facts, However, what we generally get more excited about is why we do what we do. So if I ask Samantha what really turns her on about being a 
chiropractor, and I'm going to pick on you, Samantha, because I can see you, <laughs> just to warn you, uh, she might say, I love helping people get well. I love people having, the, helping people have a higher quality of life. So those are things that we can be more passionate about. We generally have more of a personal feeling about those things, and we can evoke more emotion, both in our voice and in other people. So generally when I teach pitching, I talk about the fact that in a pitch, we want to be somewhere over here in this range on the scale of informing versus persuading. Because if, our, if we just inform people, it typically won't motivate that to, them to take action. We have to get over to this excitement and this passion in order to motivate people to do something. If we think about it, we've all got a ton of stuff on our plates these days, and it's very, it takes a lot of effort to get people to move and to do something. So that's why we want to be on the persuasion, persuasive side of this scale. I'm just going to define a 60-second pitch. Uh, there are other types of pitches. I also teach business pitching, which I usually say is around a five-minute pitch that's usually given from a stage or in front of a room and usually has slide backup. So that's one kind of a pitch. Another kind of pitch that you might have heard about is the investor pitch. And this is the pitch for startups where they're trying to raise money. Think Shark Tank as a, an extreme example of that type of pitching. Uh, that usually people can relate to Shark Tank. But the 60 second pitch is very particular. And sometimes it's called the elevator pitch. It's basically what we can say in a minute or a little bit more. It's used in, in networking situations like the one that you're in today. It might be delivered to a room around a table or on Zoom like we are today, or it could be actually a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone at a networking event and they come up to you and say, so who are you and, and what do you do? And that one minute pitch is the way we can introduce ourselves, but also what it is we do and who we serve. I've put here generally no slides. That's not, this is not the type of pitch where we would employ a slide deck. However, you may be able to have a prop and that's something to think about in a room of people or even on the Zoom, I could hold something up and show it to you, like my water bottle here, for example. You might, some of you, depending on the type of business you're in, might have something that you can show that will stick in people's minds. The reason that you would wanna do that is, be, is because it would set you apart. It would be something that people would remember and think about after the fact. So keep in mind that a prop might be something that could be useful for you. I'm gonna talk for a minute here about what we don't really want to be communicating in our pitches and it is this is what i this is what i can do just laundry list of the things that i do that isn't really where we want to have our messaging in this type of pitch where we really want to have our messaging is how we and what we do can transform either the life of the person we're speaking to or someone they know if they work with us how can you be different? How can your life be different, better, we'll say, if you engage with me? If you choose to work with me, what will you have? And I'm going to share that with you because I've used my own pitch as an example all the way through this presentation. So you'll see some of that a little bit later. But we want, this is what attracts people, this idea of, wow, I could use that. that I, that's a skill I could really use, or that's a product I could really use. Some of you are in insurance. We have a real broad range of people here today, which is fantastic. But think about it for your business and who you are and what you do. How do you transform people? How are they different after they have engaged with you? And I think everybody can get to the place where they can see what kind of a difference they make with their clients. So the objective of this elevator pitch or our 60 second pitch is to attract and intrigue. What you want people to do after they've heard your pitch is to say, oh my gosh, tell me more. I had a hard time figuring, finding a picture of this girl uh, who looks intrigued, right? She looks, yeah, like I wanna know more. But that's where we want people. 
One of the mistakes that people make when they create their pitch is they try to tell people everything. You don't have to tell people everything. In fact, you don't want to tell people everything. You want your pitch to start a conversation. And I know back in the, in the what we can call olden days, I guess now, when we were in a room with people, after everybody's done their introduction, there's a bit of time when people can network and meet each other one-on-one -on -one and learn more. So that's really what you want this pitch to do, is to get people curious about how you do what you do. What you do, but then also how you do it. Like you might say, I help people grow six feet. Well, how do you do that? How do you do that? I'm really intrigued by that. So that's where our pitch needs to sit from the standpoint of what we're telling people, what content we put in our pitch. So some of the things that I teach when I teach pitching are these key concepts. What we want our pitch to be is clear, we want it to be impactful and we want it to be memorable. We want it to be something that people recall after the fact. And there are some hows as to how we get there, how we get this what. Structure is very important. We're gonna look a little, little bit at structure today, but when I teach pitching, I go deep into structure. We're gonna look at the concept of keywords. What is the vocabulary you are using to describe what you do, to describe how you do it. Vocabulary is key. It needs to be specific and it needs to be colorful. We want colorful language in our pitches. It's very important to have consistency in the way that we speak about things when we pitch. If you do something mechanical or have a process, you want to describe that using very similar language every time. Because even though there might be more than one way to describe it, you will lose people if you, if you change it up too much. So be consistent in the way that you describe key elements of your business or key elements of your practice. Repetition is very key. People typically do not remember things unless they've heard them about seven times. I've even read as many as 16. So don't be afraid to repeat things. I noticed that I think it was, uh, the woman from the newspaper today when she introduced herself she repeated her name and her company name at again at the end of her introduction somebody else might have done it too but i noticed that one that's a very good practice because people may have forgotten your name now on zoom we have the benefit of being able to see the names we can read them and that does help retention however you want to be repeating things more than one time for them to begin to stick the other thing that really helps memorability and impactfulness are stories. In a 60 second pitch, it's pretty, you have to have a pretty short story in there. However, there are ways of creating little teeny stories that also can be used in even a 60 second pitch. We're not going to have a chance to go into that in detail today, but it is one of the things I teach in my, in my challenges and my workshops. So those are the hows of, of how we create a pitch. Another point I like to make about a pitch is that it is a living thing. This is some organisms here in a Petri dish. It can change and you want it to change. The other thing that you may want is a series of small pitches. This was something I had a woman participate in my five day challenge just a week ago who's in insurance. And she realized during the time we worked together that she does many small things and she could have a pitch about each one of those little products. Uh, about a process for the guy. I can also see Z painting here right in front of me. So maybe you have different ways of painting and you want to do a pitch about what's special about each way that you apply paint or dry paint or whatever the case might be. So think about having a series of pitches. It's a good thing in these groups where you're seeing more or less the same people each time to change it up and, and go specific into an aspect. Keep in mind that people remember the specific. People are often afraid to be too specific because they'll leave someone out. Well, if you have a series of three pitches that you rotate in an event like this, you'll hit everybody at some point, but you won't, you, you'll be able to, you're not trying to pack too much into one communication event. So we're gonna look at the specific content of your 60 second pitch. What should be in this pitch? The first thing is who you are. And this is what you basically gave this morning is this 
introduction. Full name and title. I'm a proponent of full names. What you do, so your activity, and then who you do that for. And you want to get this in in the very beginning because if people stop listening or like they wander away in an in-person kind of event, at least they've gotten that much. So be sure that this gets clearly stated at the very beginning of your pitch. The next thing we talk about is the problem that you solve. What is your pain? What is the pain that you're dealing with? And I, I have a client right now who's uh, a coach and I'm working with him to create his pitch. And I asked him last week, so what is the problem that you solve? And he's like, well, I don't really solve a problem. And I was like, well, that's a bit of a problem in, in itself. Because if you don't solve a problem for people, they're not that likely to uh, take you up on what you're offering. So we need to think in terms of what is the problem that we solve. We all solve one. Even a wine counselor that I worked with a, a few a couple years ago. He didn't think he solved a problem either. And yet the room of people that we were in at the time told him all the different problems he solved. We came up with about five problems that he solved. So you all solve problems and you want to talk about that first. Before you talk about what you, how you solve the problem, you have to lay out the problem and be very clear about that. We want to talk about it from the, and we want to use fairly colorful language when we create our problem statement. The, the next thing then is our solution. So how do we solve the problem? And what will change in their life if they work with you? So this is that transformation piece and you wanna be very specific here. You wanna very specifically tell people how they will be different or how their life will be different if they engage with you. You want to be very clear about who you serve, your ideal or target client, because you want people to steer people to you. You want people to know who to identify in their world that could use what you do. So we need to be very specific about who it is that we work with. And then the last thing is your ask. So every pitch needs an ask. That is why we pitch. And people expect an ask. This is another thing that people get blocked on they tend to ask for the same thing over and over and over. Switch up your asks. Look at that room. Look at the people who are in that room. What could they provide you with? Is it just referrals? Is it just possible clients? Or is it resources? Think about the things you need and what this audience might be able to help you get. And that should be your ask. And your ask should not be the same every week. You need to change up your asks for sure. So I'm going to go through now and give you an example using myself as to how this might look. And I will offer you a template uh, that I'll send to Connor at the end today and that you'll be able to download so that you'll have this uh, information. So for example, this, this could be my intro. I'm Barbara Bolt. I'm an executive communication skills coach. I help business owners, entrepreneurs, and nonprofit leaders master Delivering clear, impactful, memorable pitches. Very specific language. Don't notice I don't say, I help people. I tell you specifically who are the people that I help so that you can begin to think about who do you know in that bucket or one of those buckets. So the next thing I said is problem and we want to get to the pain of what people are dealing with. I wrote, we live in a loud, busy world where multitasking and attention deficiency are the norm. How do you attract new clients or pitch a breakthrough idea or raise funds if nobody's listening? So that's the pain that I address. It's the pain of getting heard and, and having a pitch that resonates and that people really get. A solution then that I provide <clears throat> I show business owners, nonprofit leaders, and entrepreneurs how to craft a pitch that captures attention, stimulates interest, and gets people to take action. So you'll notice here that I've repeated once again, who are those people I'm looking to serve? By name, I've put them very specifically in there again. That's repetition. People might be starting to remember who it is I'm looking for. Then here's the transformation part of the solution. 
This is what people get if they work with me. So this is a way you want to frame that. If you work with me, you will. I have I put in here today, own a flexible, compelling elevator pitch that you can deliver with presence and confidence. And I'm not sure own is the best word there, but that's the one I came up with when I created the slide. And the second thing I wrote is engage people with memorable, intriguing stories. So this is what you will be able to do if you work with me. You want to think about that. What do people get? What's the result? What's the outcome for them that makes their life better, easier, more exciting? Then we want to describe exactly who we help. So this is your ideal client. We've mentioned them several times already. Here I went into a little bit more detail. Business owners who need to promote their businesses. Nonprofit leaders who need to raise funds and gain support. Entrepreneurs who need to find partners, clients, and raise funds. So these are exactly the people that I serve. And finally, we come to the ask. If you know of anyone in any of these categories who could improve their ability to communicate a clear message, please refer them to. You could state it like that, but there are lots of ways to state and ask. What I do recommend is that you actually do use the word ask. This is my ask today, because that triggers people to listen. If you actually state that word, uh, my ask today is, this is my ask, ask, Oop, they start tuning in. So you want to use the word ask in order to get people's attention if they have drifted or if they're multitasking or doing something else. I'm at 22 minutes. Connor, can you tell me how much more time I have? Yes, so we're at uh, 1.13 right now. Uh, you can have uh, about another seven minutes and leaving 10 minutes for the remainder. All right, seven minutes. I'm gonna rock it through the rest of this. I, I wanted to, to bring up the topic of uh, impression, the impression that you make and how that ties into delivery in particular. I'm gonna answer this question for you, but I think you all know people make a, or come up with an impression of you very, very quickly. It's basically in the first seconds that they lay eyes on you. And then when you've opened your mouth, it, it, it deepens the experience for them. So I generally say nanoseconds. I believe I've seen between three and seven seconds. That's about how long it takes somebody to form an impression. And we know this statement, don't we? You, you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. I've actually had people push back on that a couple of times and say, oh, but we should really all give people a second chance. And of course, I agree with that. I think we should. However, there are some reasons why it's not as easy as you think. It's, and it's because of our biological hardwiring. We're actually hardwired to size each other up very quickly. And this goes back to prehistoric times when there was an enemy or we had to defend ourselves. First impressions are influenced by physical factors like voice, perceived emotional state, what you wear, how you uh, stand, the way your body language, what your body is saying to people, all of this goes into forming this first impression. So the bottom line is when we find ourselves in networking situations, we need to be very careful about what we're doing with our, our faces, our voices, uh, and if we have had a, a stressful drive or something like that, we want to try to de-stress de a bit before we stand in front of the room because we may communicate that stress and that may affect somebody's first impression of us. The bottom line is we get attached to our first impressions and they are not that easy to change. So save yourself the trouble and make a good one rather than having to get yourself back in someone's good graces because for some reason they, they had a, a bad impression of you. I'm just going to talk about two aspects of delivery today. The first one is confidence. So thinking about how do we deliver this message that we've created confidently in front of the room. And these are some things that we want to keep in, touch, in, in mind. Posture is extremely important. We want to stand up straight and tall and keep our body relatively still. No rocking, no leaning on anything. Uh, just try to really remove any distractions with your body that, that might be in place. You want to look people in the eye. 
And that's interesting in the Zoom reality, we have a difficult time doing that. But if you're in person around it, like people around a table, look at everyone and make sure you don't leave out one end of the table or the other end of the table. You want to use your hands to communicate your verbal message. Again, on Zoom, this is kind of tricky. I've got my table super high today. But if I wanted to say I provide three things, I can count on my fingers. I can draw something with my hands. What we want is intentional hand movements. What we don't want is wringing the hands or this kind of thing. I see this a lot in networking contexts, and it's, it, people don't even know they're doing it. So if you have an awareness or somebody tells you, did you realize you were kind of wringing your hands? Try to break that habit because it isn't powerful. It isn't, doesn't communicate confidence. We definitely want to be speaking loudly that it reaches everyone in the room, however big the room might be. And the other thing I, I threw in here at the very last minute is watching the small words and the minimizers. Become aware of the degree to which you use um, so, like, right, all of these little filler connector words. When you're pitching, you do not have time to use those little words. You need to cut them out because they're taking the place of a word that you need more. So, and they are also distracting. And then minimizer words are the kind of sort of just a little bit words. And we also want to cut those out if we can. The other factor here is likability. If we want referrals and we want people to send people to us, they need to like us. And some of the ways we can communicate likability are the, the ever famous smile. We definitely want to be smiling, at least through most of our pitch. We don't need the, you know, the grin pasted on our face, but smiling at appropriate moments, keeping our energy upbeat, but not forced. We don't want to be the cheerleader in the room necessarily. A friendly warm tone, which comes with a smile. When we smile, we sound warmer. And then keep our, keeping our moves more casual and relaxed, that simply means don't, don't be too abrupt about our gestures. Last piece of advice here is how we learn a pitch. And I hate to break it to you, but there is some work involved. So it isn't always easy. The best way, especially with a 60 second pitch, is to write it out word for word so that you have it all there and you can work on your vocabulary, work on those words. Then you want to start to say it out loud. And this, you will read it at first, everybody does, but you want to gradually divorce yourself from the script so that you don't sound like you're reading. You don't want your pitch to sound like a re re recitation. You want it to sound natural. You want it to sound uh, like you really know it. You can adjust words as you go. If you're stumbling on a word that you wrote into your pitch, change it. Get it out of there. You, don't, you, you can find an alternative. You don't want to be stumbling. Practice with a supportive person. This is not your cat. This is someone who can actually give you feedback, but someone who will be constructive with you. They won't just say, oh, that was great, right? It, it might be great, <laughs> but you want to know if there's something that should be changed. Record yourself. This is the best advice. Record yourself on your phone, play it back. You got to watch it. I know some people hate that, but you do need to make sure you've watched it and then just keep practicing. And as you change little things in it, practice more. So that is all the content I have. I want to share with you that I do have another perfect pitch challenge coming up. This is something I'm going to be doing regularly. And of course, the second one's going to be better than the first one because I learned a whole bunch doing the first one. The next edition is going to start on October 1st. It, it's going to meet each day from 12 to 1.30, a Thursday, a Friday, and then a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So there's a weekend break in, in, the, in the five days. I'm only charging $55 for this because I, it's a way that I'm helping people to understand who I am and how I can help them. But if you sign up by Friday, September 11th, you'll also get a free 30 minute consultation with me to discuss your specific pitch, which there won't be time to do during the, during the challenge. So I'll leave it there. I'll turn it back to Connor. And thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you, Barbara. That was wonderful. Uh, we did have quite a few questions uh, that appeared right. in the chat. So uh, I'm just going to kind of start going through those. 
Uh, so we had a question from Jeffrey. Um, he says, uh, I do a lot of telephone prospecting. Can you do an effective 60 second pitch on the phone with a person or company you are not familiar with? Um, well, I would say 60 seconds might be a bit long if they haven't met you before. You, you're gonna wanna get interaction from them, I think before, maybe more like 30 seconds. So I would keep maybe to the first part of the pitch and try to get some, in, then do some information gathering, ask them some questions, and after they, you've gotten some interaction going, you can tell them more. So that would be my feedback on that. Okay. Uh, another question from Dragon from Z Painting uh, was, when giving the pitch, you mentioned uh, including your full name. Uh, is that including your full personal name and the full company name? As well as why is the title, mentioning your title so important? I would, I believe in giving your full name and the full name of the company. That's what people need to know. And to me, if you just say, my name is Kim, or my name is Dan, Dan who, right? And, and, and if, especially if there are people in that room who haven't met you before and don't know you. The, what was the second part of that question, Connor? Why is the mentioning your title so important? Well, it depends. If you're the CEO, you want people to know you're the CEO. If you're a sales representative, generally you want people to know your role because it helps them understand it's, it's a credibility issue. Why are you there? Why are you the person who's making this presentation? So generally title is involved with your credibility to be saying what you're saying. Okay. Uh, another question from Emily was, uh, when you say we should share what we do and who we do it for, in regards to the who aspect of it, do you mean who our target client is or who they help? Who your target client is, who generally is going to be who you help. So yeah, it's, it's the target client because you want people to understand who it is that you actually work with. Okay. And lastly, uh, from Matthew, uh, this one kind of made me chuckle. Uh, what if you are way taller and bigger uh, than the person you're speaking with? Would not standing up straight be more intimidating than that? Well, it depends. Uh, if it's a one-on-one -on -one situation and you're in a, in a in a coffee shop, obviously you can sit and that would maybe mitigate the height issue a little bit. But if you're in a stand-up networking kind of situation, you're simply, that difference is going to be there. What I would say, I mean, I don't think hunching is ever a solution to not intimidating someone, but being friendly and, and using your voice can maybe mitigate also a height issue where you feel like you're just towering over people and, and might be intimidating. But I would, I, I would say that people should always stand up straight. Wonderful. And I just Don't got wear elevator one. shoes, but you know, stand up straight. <laughs> yeah, we have quite a few tall individuals in attendance today. Right. Um, and lastly, a follow up question. Uh, so, if you, to us, one you answered previously, uh, if you sell, what if you sell insurance and your target audience is it everyone essentially because everyone needs insurance? Um, of course, there are those buying homes or new cars, but in a general sense, uh, you know, you're, from what I'm reading from the question, Insurance, everyone is going to need it. Uh, how do you uh, boil you that to, down for a target audience? Yeah, you want to you want to divvy up your target audiences. You want to think about the boat owners. You want to think about the homeowners. You basically want to segment by product, probably product line, and then speak specifically to each of those. So this is the case that I was saying that I had this woman in my challenge who was an insurance agent, and she realized that she could tell different little stories about each of her products, about something that happened to someone who was a boat owner, about something that happened to someone who needed auto insurance, about uh, you break it up so that each time you're pitching, you're talking about something specific. You can then say, we offer all insurances, but today I'm going to highlight X, Y, Z. And because specific will land far better. And if you just say, I, I help everybody. Nobody really knows who to refer to you. You know, they're not going to think of their brother-in-law who just bought a boat, or they're not going to think of their aunt who uh, just bought a new house. So you want people to think in the specific, even though you, maybe you help everybody. And people generally will know that, but you want to be, your pitch wants to be specific. Okay. 
Uh, and one uh, last question that I see here, um, should uh, groups such as our referral networking groups, uh, especially back when they were in person, but should these groups be, uh, when they're doing their pitches and practicing them, should they be standing while they're practicing? Uh, certain groups, uh, uh, this individual mentions that they always stand when they're giving their uh, 60 second, others, uh, the entire group is sitting. Still um, sitting, yeah. I, I am a proponent of standing when you speak, whether it's pitching, whether it's a presentation, be, and it's about breathing and energy. You, if you're standing, you, you have access to your diaphragm and you're gonna breathe more effectively, project your voice more. I see Samantha smiling, she knows what a diaphragm is, right? <laughs> and uh, it, it, it changes the way you feel and it changes the way you put yourself out there. I get it that in some rooms, nobody stands and you don't want to be the only person standing. I've been in that situation myself. I will still stand because I'm stubborn. However, I know that not everybody wants to, but what you at least want to do is sit up straight. Don't be a slouch pitcher, right? You know, the people that just stay back in the armchair. You can't project your voice effectively. And from my point of view, it simply doesn't look very professional. So if everybody's sitting and the, the the norm is to stay seated, at least sit up straight. Uh, but I would challenge you to stand because it also will set you apart. Wonderful.